UFOs, monsters, mysteries. You're listening to Talking Weird. And now, from a cabin deep in the Northwoods, your hosts, Dr. Dean Bertram and Jen Durrell. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Well, I'd like to welcome all of our listeners to this Halloween edition of Talking Weird. Of course, it's that time of the year when the veil between this world and the next is meant to be at its thinnest, and all kinds of spectres and beasties prowl the night and peek in at our windows. So it's a perfect time for you to lock your doors, hunker in, and listen to this, the latest episode of Talking Weird. And speaking of the spooky season, baby... Do you have any special plans? Well, my town this year is actually in the clear. We get to have Halloween. Uh, the kids and I on Friday are going to go to a downtown trick-or-treat, and then there is a trunk-or-treat. So we'll get to do two of those and get lots of candy. And then on Saturday, um, I think there's another trunk-or-treat, and then we're going to do the typical Halloween and go around the neighborhood and pass out candy. So we're not missing out this year. So what are you doing? Well, I'll carve a pumpkin, of course, then probably take my daughter trick-or-treating in this tiny little hamlet, which is the closest town to our cabin in the North Woods. And when you wander the streets there on Halloween night, you can kind of imagine that it hasn't really changed that much, I would think, since the 1970s. So I love getting that fix of traditional Midwest All Hallows Eve. And then later that night, after my little one goes to sleep, I'll no doubt eat some of her candy and watch my favorite film for the season, which is Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Long underrated and even mocked and hated, but recently getting some of the love that it very much deserves. But anyway, tonight's show is appropriately all about ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night. Our guest is the host of the radio show and podcast From the Basement, the author of an upcoming book to be published by Shannon Legros Beyond the Fray Publishing Imprint, and is the creator of the fantastic new web series We Want to Believe. I'm delighted to welcome to the show Jason Hewlett. I've really been enjoying We Want to Believe, Jason, and maybe we could kick off with you telling us a little bit about how you became involved with our mutual friend and your co-producer, John Fallon, along with his company, Arrow in the Head, and Joe Blow, to actually make the show. Well, it's a bit of a longish story. I I do another show called uh, From the Basement, which has been called We Came From the Basement Before. And it it started as a podcast that went onto campus radio in 2010, although I'm far too old to be going to university. But um, they they wanted to have the show on. And one of the first people we interviewed, actually the first person we interviewed uh, was John Fallon, because of course, you know, Arrow in the Head, right? And he'd been in some films. And so we wanted to have him on and chatted with him. And as happens sometimes when you interview someone, you stay in touch and then you become friends, mm-hmm. um, which which we did through you know subsequent meetings. And, and I did a horror film festival here in my hometown called Dark Fest. And John was our guest and he brought out a couple of his films. Um, and so we just kept in touch. And you know I, I'm a writer and I have a film background. So we worked together on some scripts, et cetera. And um, I know someone named Peter Wren who who runs Vancouver Paranormal Society and has been doing this for a good, you know, paranormal investigation for a good 27 years. And he and I were going to do a podcast because that's sort of my forte is broadcasting and podcasting. And I'd gone and done a, a, a Facebook live video just to kind of promote an investigation we were doing for the podcast. And John saw it and, and hit me up and said, you know, that video was really good, but why do a podcast? You should do a YouTube show because they were launching Joe Blow Horror videos at the time. And I'm the kind of person that will say yes without really thinking about how I'm going to pull it off. So I did that <laughs> and then had to really figure out how I was going to pull it off because I hadn't shot anything in like 20 years. So, and had no crew really or, or anything like that. So it's something that kind of just came together that way and all the stars aligned properly. Um, and we were able to shoot the pilot back in February, just before COVID hit. 
kind of edit it together. And the pilot actually became four episodes, the first four, which is the Demon Jar. And they started unraveling at Joe Blow Horror videos in May. And it's just kind of gone from there. Um, that's kind of the Cliff Notes version, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a it's a cool show. I enjoyed the hotel episode or the demon jar as the first four parts were called. I I always find those kind of places almost to be expected to be haunted. And I'm not sure whether that's because there's actually ghostly presences there or whether there's a weird energy left over from people moving in and out of spaces. I remember talking to Greg Newkirk. A little while ago. In fact, I think it was when we were even interviewing him on this show when we were running um, the Midwest Weird Fest Film Festival in Eau Claire. And Greg was talking about how often it's these liminal kind of places or these in-between places that seem to perhaps be a deposit for something. Is there? Do you have any take on on that kind of idea? Yeah, we're. I, I have a real belief, and it's something that Peter and I have talked about a lot. That you know, we're we're all we all have energy, right? We're, we're made up of energy and that energy has to go somewhere. It doesn't go away. So when we die or even when traumatic things happen, that energy is kind of left behind. Um, so, so you're right. I think a place like that, that's a hotel, which has like a working bar in it. That's going to create a lot of energy. You know what I mean? Anyways, mm -hmm. as people come and go, and then you have a place that's kind of being used for social housing where people have mm -hmm. died, um, you know, either through overdoses or other means that's going to leave behind an imprint as well. And then if, you know, if people have actually died in the building, the theory is that those people, their energy stays behind too, as some form of activity. So a place like this hotel definitely was ripe for it. I also think there's also, we, we as investigators or just people in general have an expectation. You go to this old hotel with kind of a, a sordid history and you're going to think something could possibly happen anyways. And there's always an argument, do we kind of almost create that out of our own wish fulfillment? And that's something as paranormal investigators we struggle with sometimes. I think too, as you mentioned, then the fact that it's social housing, which I hadn't heard the term before, but I think it means a government assisted type housing project. Is yeah, that yeah, correct? That's Canadian or? for that. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so I know at one stage in, I can't remember if it's the first or the second episode, but there's somebody yelling across the hallway when you're talking to the gentleman who manages the hotel and He's screaming at what might or might not be demons, but there's also, of course, that implication that he might be mentally unwell or there might be some other problem there. And I think as well as sometimes spaces, which are these in-between places like hotels and the like being potentially haunted, there's certainly the idea that people who exist in stressful situations or have a lot of psychic crises in their own life are more likely to either manifest these type of experiences or somehow attract these type of experiences. So I suspect that might be something else you guys looked at a little bit while you were in that hotel as well, or, or it might've crossed your minds anyway. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's no secret that people do who do experience trauma seem at least more open to these occurrences going on. Um, I mean, you have to question, we didn't get to talk to the gentleman himself. So, you know, was he really seeing something or was it more in his brain? What was really compelling for us um, is that, you know, he's yelling at something he's calling a demon, um, which is a whole other kettle of fish, obviously. But, you know, then we had the person talking, you know, who had left what they, they ended up calling the demon jar mm -hmm. at the hotel. And then even on the spirit box, we picked up a demon on the spirit box. I mean, it was kind of an elect electronic voice sort of sound, but those three things together that's as close, I think, in, in paranormal investigation as you can get to any kind of real evidence is, is when you're corroborating one story with some other bit that kind of, you know, if, if all taken on their own terms, wouldn't mean much, but you put it all together and it means something. So whether you believe in demons or not, it, it was an interesting, um, I, I can't say coincidence. It was just an interesting development as the investigation went on that day. Actually, as, as Jen and I often tease each other back and forward, my interpretation of a lot of particularly ghost type paranormal phenomenon is that it most likely is demonic. I, I have, I, for some <laughs> reason, find it easier to accept that interpretation than it always being spirits of the dead. I tend to think a lot of it's very tricksterish and it's something perhaps playing around with us, but I'll let Jen tell a quick story, which we hadn't actually talked about before right now. So I'm throwing this at you, Jen. We had a hotel experience when you and I were in a hotel for Midwest Weird Fest in Eau Claire. Did you want to tell Jason and the audience that story? Oh. 
Well, it's nothing like a demon or anything. Uh, we were trying to go to sleep, and I could hear children in the hallway. So, oh, wow. um, I, I asked him if he heard it, and he's like, no. Of course, he had already fallen asleep. So, I mean, he's literally jumping up in fear when I ask him. <laughs> and he said, no, I don't hear it. And I'm like, okay. And then I try to go back to sleep, and I'm like, you don't hear that? So, of course, he's jumping up again. So, it just got to the point, and it was so ridiculous, that I had to go out into the hallway to see if there was any children, and there wasn't. See, that's creepy. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you you try being woken up with somebody saying, "Did you hear that child laugh?" <laughs> 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 what? <laughs> children laughing can be creepy enough on its own terms <laughs> at certain times of the night. My son used to do that when he was a kid, and it would just you know you wake up and just like, "What the is that?" <laughs> oh, I know. I I have a four year old daughter, and there are, there have been times in the middle of the night when she's woken with all kinds of strange disturbances and. Uh, and you forget there's a child in the room sometimes. You're like, ah! And it's like, oh, it's just my daughter. Yes. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Been there many times, my friend, with my son. So, <laughs> Oh, that's, that's funny. In the show so far, though, I have dug the barn one. Probably the most out of all of those episodes. They were all interesting, but this one's really, you seem to have hit your stride with it. Do you want to tell the audience a little bit who might have seen the show yet a little bit about that episode? Yeah, and, and and thank you for that. That's kind of where we felt we'd really hit our, our mark too. Um, it was like the first one, the first four were like the learning curve. And by the time we got to the fourth one, it felt, you know, like we'd hit the mark. But this one was so much more so. And I think partly <laughs> partly because it was it was the place we went to where we got the least. <laughs> so we had to kind of <laughs> really work with it in, in terms of editing and, and music and without overdoing it. Because the whole point of the show is, is to show it as realistically as possible. A paranormal investigation and not Hollywoodize it too much. So what was interesting, D, who is the owner of this barn, uh, which is in the interior of British Columbia, about an hour and 15 minutes from where I live in Kamloops, contacted Peter saying she was experiencing these mysterious water droplets that would sort of appear out of nowhere. And this was something that struck a chord with Peter, who who is the president of Vancouver Paranormal Society. And it's it's the oldest, you know, society of its kind in, in Canada, possibly even North America. Because he had investigated a case in North Vancouver where something very similar had been materializing um, water droplets out of nowhere, and they, they did a number of investigations at this location. So we decided, we were actually supposed to head out to the barn a lot earlier, but of course with the, the lockdown because of the pandemic, we had to sit for about two and a half months before we could get there. Um, and the activity, you know, I mean, fortunately for us, but unfortunately for Dee, it didn't stop. It seemed to escalate a bit. So when we got to this barn which if you've seen the episode, it's not your typical creepy barn at all. It's a beautiful spot on, on, a, on a creek that Dee has renovated into this wonderful place where people can get married and, you know, and do family gatherings and get pictures taken. But she is experiencing water that will materialize out of nowhere, particularly when she's doing something related to food and get these water droplets on her and quite a bit of it. But it's got to the point where when she leaves the barn now, even to go visit like a mom or a relative, that will happen in these other places. So it, it proved really interesting for us to kind of go and hear her story. Um, and in part two, you'll, you'll meet Jen, who, who's a psychic we brought in to talk to her just because it was something different. And, and, you know, psychics are a whole other kettle of fish uh, when you're dealing with this kind of thing. But yeah, it was just an interesting thing to hear her story, kind of the history of this barn, which it was owned by a previous couple. And the guy used to keep chickens in the attic of the barn that he was doing experiments on. And it just was weird. And, and at some point, as you saw at the very end of the first episode, the police showed up, uh -huh. uh, which, which was scary, not for the usual reasons when you're doing a paranormal <laughs> investigation, but uh, I guess someone had seen us filming and when they were driving by and called it in as an active shooter incident. And oh my goodness. three police cars showed up. <laughs> so yeah, it was, uh, that was, it was pretty exciting. I don't, we resolved that matter in, in sort of the second episode of, of the barn because it's a two-parter, but that's sort of the setup for it. Um, and what we ended up finding was less to do with the barn itself and more to do with some, whatever's there. It, it's, it's related to something going on with D and not the property that we could find, which brings up a whole other, uh, right. you know, level of like, you know, talking about spiritual attachment, mm -hmm. what that can mean for someone, even if it's like a, you know, benign spirit, it's still not a good thing to have any real spirit attached to you. So it was, it was very different than the demon jar, which was more of a traditional haunting. This was something more about a person and, and activity around a person as opposed to the building itself. It's like the barn just happened to be this place where D was at. So yeah. it was interesting stuff. 
I've had my own experience with the water droplet phenomenon. Really? And yeah, from what I have learned, it's um, it's kind of linked from angelic messages all the way to like pol- poltergeist activity, at least different theories that I've learned. Um, well, there's one that's very interesting that caught my attention because it made sense for me. And there's a theory that the droplets are a connection from unresolved sorrow. Hmm. When certain people, if they're sensitive or they have psychic psychic abilities, they become upset and they they let their emotions fester rather than come out. And then the emotions are built up, you know, into the atmosphere and around them. And it just like manifests as into little water droplets, like um, pent up emotions. You know how they would leave oh. in an imprint as we were talking about energy earlier. So from those emotions, it manifests itself into a form of water drops, almost like um, as if it's tears, you know, that you hadn't physically cried. That's interesting. And see that we want to go back, uh, you know, if in the future for another episode and, and do, because when we filmed it, we did the tour with Dee and she left. And like, other than the police, pretty much not much happened. I don't want to spoil it for people. There, there's still lots of stuff to watch, but nothing that you'd expect in, in terms of a you know, paranormal investigation and EVPs much really happened. But we want to go back and do something with her there and see if that actually brings something out. Because mm-hmm. I, I think if it's related to her, and if, you, if what you're saying, you know, in terms of that, you know, not dealing with the proper sorrow in the past, right. that might, mm-hmm. I'd like to see how, you know, how that would work, come out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Having not seen the drops ourselves. And again, that goes a little bit back to what we were talking about before, the possibility that it's always people that are haunted more than the locations, but we tend to think about a location being haunted. Maybe it's the people who are in there or the energy of the people who have been in there. But before we stop talking about water drop phenomenon, which I've still got a little bit to talk about, I don't know if I've heard you ever tell the story about your experience with that phenomenon, Jen. Mm -hmm. Mine started when my brother passed away. So we were in the hospital and we'd get these little drops. And so, you know, of course, you're looking up, like, is there a leak in the ceiling? And I wasn't the only one experiencing it. So we just kind of, you know, chucked it aside and think nothing of it. And then we would go into a restaurant, which, of course, you're mentioning food with D. We would go into the restaurant and sit down at a table and we I'd get a drop or maybe they would get a drop. And so back then, we just kind of thought, well, may, maybe it was a sign from Chris because we kept seeing his truck everywhere. And this is an old truck. I mean, it's a 1971 Chevy Cheyenne. I mean, everywhere we looked. Um, but there was a, what I guess what really got my attention and made me think more about it was a year later, um, I put together a tribute jam night for him, like kind of a memory of him. So there was tons of people there. And I know I have got, I got really, really upset. And I started experiencing the drops again. But nobody else was. So uh, I didn't see that there was, you know, anything wrong with the ceiling. So even when I moved somewhere else, I still got the drops. So it's not something I experience now. But when I was grieving really, really bad for my brother, I mean, it was like all the time. And Were there any sort of triggers for it, Jen? You know what I mean? Or any kind of catalyst that would set it off? Or would it just kind of just start? It just did it on its own. And then it got my attention. So usually... It has to do, I think, really had to do with the grieving because it was it was pretty rough. So, yeah, I think that's what kind of triggered it. I don't know. Hmm. You know, it's weird you said it first started happening in the hospital because I'd heard about the phenomenon before, but obviously in the lead up to this show, I wanted to, you know, Google and have a look at it and refresh my memory. Right. And one of the stories I found, it's still open on my desktop now, and this is truly bizarre, is the woman saying, the first time this happened to me, I was in the hospital room with my dad who was extremely ill. And it falls from the ceiling and the whole family are looking up to see if there's a a vent or if there's any cracks in the ceiling and there's nothing there. Maybe this is an example of when it does manifest under times of that kind of incredible psychic stress. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do with all that emotion? So It just makes sense that something like that, since we're made out of energy, can kind of fester up and and manifest itself in that way drops are a little different but i don't know you know how how that would work (laughs) i don't know if there's anything to do with condensation i don't know it also kind of ties into a lot of ideas about the spontaneous manifestation of liquids which are attached to 
religious beliefs, particularly Catholicism, with things appearing, a Jesus statue, you know, bleeding from the hands or a Mary yeah. statue crying, you know, it reminded me of that as well, to be honest. Definitely. Definitely. And it, it, that's, that's been recorded throughout history, yeah. that sort of manifestation of liquid. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a variation on that in some way. Um, but you're right, brought on by grief, grief or, or yeah. trauma uh, as well. That makes perfect sense now, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. standing back and looking at it and hearing Jen's story, you know, and the other one you were mentioning too, Dean, that, made, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So it'd be neat to hear, to talk further in our case to Dee to find out more yeah. about her background mm -hmm. and what maybe is going on. I know she was trying to sell the place um, and was having difficulty with that. So that could kind of create its own form of stress as well, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Throw in a global pandemic on top of it and <laughs> right. you've, you've got, exactly. yeah. Well, I think they say moving is like after losing a loved one is the next hardest thing you have to do in your life. I think I read that yeah. somewhere recently. Same, same. It does sound, if you're not aware of the phenomenon, like if you're not into this stuff and if you haven't researched it or experienced it like Jen or, or really thought about it, it, it's an apparition or a phenomenon which seems very weird. And I think is it in the show, is it Sean, who when yeah. D tells the story, he's almost so taken aback, he has to leave the room because he's laughing. Yeah, yeah, laughing inside because he's he's our resident skeptic and, and and atheist, right? And so for him, you know, he just <laughs> almost couldn't really handle right. it, um, you know. And then you're thinking food. Well, that could you know, you could be salivating. That could be you know, in, in his mind, uh -huh. he's logically going through all these other processes that maybe that's what's going on, right? Oh, it sounds super ridiculous. I agree. It, it does. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it, and when I was filming it, I was, I was listening to you talk and I was looking at, because I've known Sean for like a quarter of a century, right? So I kind of looked over at him and I could see, that's why suddenly you, you get, you see him leaving the room because I turned the right. camera. Yeah. So I'm like, what is he going to do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and there's a great shot because he kept filming as he backed out yeah. the door and turned it from his camera point of view, but we didn't end up using it. But <laughs> it was, it was pretty funny. Oh, it's a great moment in the show as well. And speaking of great moments, there's... When I think, is it Peter who goes up into the roof and somebody hands him the camera and he, he spins it around in the attic? Is that where the chickens used to be kept? You almost expect to see something up there, like out of a Japanese horror movie or something. <laughs> totally. Yeah, and that was, yeah, Peter went up. We were on the level where the chickens were kept. So when he went up the ladder, I, oh, okay. I handed him the camera and that was sort of the last level. But we were showing that there was no real pipes or anything up there that could have caused this condensation to go through two levels. But yeah, it was, I, I, cause I hadn't had the chance to look up there when we actually reviewed the footage. That's the first time. And I got the same thing. I expected something to be out there. And I think a lot of people watching it are waiting for that mm -hmm. moment, yeah. of course, you know, right. but we're not that kind of show where we're going to throw something at you <laughs> that wasn't there. But I think, yeah, it, 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 there's moments like that. I got a lot of good reactions out of people, which, which is good, which is nice, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, people got into it like they have. Well, that's something when you say it's not that type of show that really grabbed my attention when I first watched The Barn is in one of the title cards, it says this show will take a very un-Hollywood look at the pseudoscience of paranormal investigation. So do you want to talk a little bit about that being your approach to it as well? Yeah. And that, that was, that's kind of twofold uh, for us. Like, because we, we don't just do this to film it. Like, like Peter, you know, he has been a paranormal investigator for 27 years. I've been working with him for the last three and doing my own investigations for like 15, 16 years. And, and a lot of the shows, as much as I love watching a lot of these ghost hunting shows, they're, they're not always the most accurate. <laughs> you know what I no, mean? And, and you've heard many cases of them, <laughs> things being staged, oh, yeah. it, you know, and I like to pick on Zach Baggins because he gets possessed on a weekly basis, which yes. I've, that doesn't just Very happen. True. You know what I mean? So, and Peter had been approached many times by many different production companies, including Netflix, to do a show. And he's always refused because he, if he does it, he wants it to be shown the way that it really is, you know, and done right without, you know, too much, you know, chamber music and, and setting up jump scares and, you know, faking stuff. We wanted to be the first show that really got nothing on, on film. And by the end of the episode, there's nothing there. Um, so when he and I talked about it, that was kind of the condition upon which we would do it. And I agreed with him a hundred percent because I, I too wanted, you know, having done it, all those other shows give what we take very seriously a bad name. Um, so, and we, we figured here's a good venue. It's YouTube. It's not like a TV network where there's like ratings and, you know, a whole bunch of money on the table that's at stake on, you know, on, on YouTube, you know, with Joe Blow, they've been very good about like, we've got carte blanche, you know, they, they got certain things they want, but they, they don't want us to fake anything either. So it's, it's worked out really well that way. So that's why we put that at the beginning, because we're not going to, 
And as you've watched all five of them, it's different than most ghost shows, all of them, because, you know, nothing really comes out hammering you with stuff in terms of like setting up a scare and then cutting away to something else and coming back and it's a cat walking through a door. We present whatever evidence we find as best we can and basically leave it up to the you, the viewer, to decide if there's anything there. Like at the end of the demon jar, we showed everything we found. We even talked about, you know, demons and how we don't think they're that real. And there's a whole bunch of other, you know, options that could be going on there. And then it's up to you to figure out by the end of the fourth episode if we got anything or not, if we're all a bunch of crackpots. So, <laughs> and that's kind of how we're doing the bar in the same way as well. Like I've, we've just did a rough edit of the second episode and present what we found in, in the same manner. And, you know, we, we think it works and, and that's what sort of sets us a bit apart from, from ghost adventures and, you know, all these other ones that are out there. It doesn't feel like a skeptical show, of course, but that title almost suggests it's going to be skeptical. And then the approach that you guys take you're correct. Nowhere in that show do you get the feeling that this is, you know, another travel, ch- not that there's anything wrong with travel channel shows. Some of them are a yeah. lot of fun, but you don't, you have no sense that it's going to be a show like that when you're watching it. You, you very quickly disillusioned if that's what you expect. And you're like, wow, this is something, this is something entirely different to anything I've ever seen before. Well, thank you. And that, that was our goal, uh, to do it that way. Cause I'm a, I'm a storyteller, you know, and a filmmaker. And so for me, I still want to tell a good entertaining story. So I want to kind of film it and, 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 you know, edit it in a way, you know, and we've got a Jason Morris, who's like an award-winning filmmaker editing it and doing all the, you know, helping out with post success extremely much. And he's really helped too, because he's figured out a way to edit it. So it's still fun to watch and with a good production value, but you're not, we're not tricking people into thinking something's going to happen, then it doesn't. We just sort of just show it and it unravels, you know, in as much of a linear format as to our investigations as we could do in the, in, in you know, in the the 10 ish minutes that we have to play around with on YouTube per, per episode. So I'm glad that it works. <laughs> it's nice to hear that. And we've heard that a lot with yeah. the barn, uh, this first part of the barn, we've heard that a lot from people that, that they like it and how it's being done. So oh, that, yeah. that, that feels good. Yeah. Jen and I, funnily enough, cause we booked this episode and rolled into it pretty quickly. And as I mentioned, <laughs> my computer had a drink <laughs> spill the other day that slowed everything down. So Jen and I haven't really talked about the show at all, actually. This is probably the most we've talked about right now. And Jen herself is a paranormal investigator. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you thought about the show, Jen? I like the direction it's going because, you know, you look on YouTube and it's a lot of it's staged. And I mean, that's how you get views. That That's just how it works. But you do, you guys catch on, you know, certain points that other people don't talk about. Like in the demon jar, you mentioned the pareidolia. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, and if you think about it, you know, there's, you know, a man screaming in one room and they tell you that, you know, it's a demon or this demon jar, all this demon word is being mentioned. And then the word you get through the spirit box is a demon, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I thought it was, it was really good that you guys brought that up. Thank you. And it was, uh, we, I, I loved Peter's reaction when he heard it. He just starts laughing. Oh yeah. <laughs> because of course, you know, he's like, really? Like we're trying to be not that show and guess what? Yeah. Like you know, first time out. <laughs> I'd just like to remind you, our very much appreciated Talking Word listener, that you can find the full Talking Word episode archive at our host site, charlesfort.org. There you will also find the world's best UFO cryptid and paranormal theme t-shirts and face masks including the official Talking Weird tea. So check it out and grab yourself some cool and weird 40 in attire. Not only will you be helping to support the show, you'll be the coolest dressed weirdo in your clique. And now we return to our irregular programming. What's the equipment you have out there in the field, Jason, that you, are the pieces that you feel are, are the most important when you're doing an investigation and this is coming from somebody with no in, no background in paranormal investigation just who's interested in it well i know for us i mean we use digital recorders a ton like that's you know the evps is the most common thing that we go out looking for so we use the like we use digital recorders we have motion control cameras with crystal lenses so that they 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 don't you know reflect the light it just kind of absorbs it so you don't get you know flashes and and flares and that kind of thing we use the spirit box which i know can be quite controversial but we've had some pretty good luck with that and then we use a laser grid as well which we actually in an upcoming episode cuz we filmed a few ahead um we we break out and we got some interesting things with that too um how how about you Jen is that sort of in line with what you've been using when you go out or uh 
Uh, yeah, usually. I My big thing is the voice recorder and I have an SB7. And the EMF, I use that, the EMF meter, but sometimes I find it a little faulty, so I don't really trust it that much, unless it's consistent when I'm mm-hmm. asking yes or no questions. Otherwise, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sh- so sure if it's legit or not, but I do I do like the EVPs and the SB7. I was going to say the same thing. Like, you know, even with EMF, like it's, it's so, there's not even a really a correct uh, that that we've found a correct level where you can suggest that that might be you know because EMF can affect people and and make them hallucinate but there's not been a consistent amount of how much EMF can cause that yeah so we we use it sometimes but we've had we've got EVPs where we've got no EMF you know oh, electromagnetic yeah. uh-huh. field so I, I I yeah it's not very consistent so we don't rely on the EMF readers that much either yeah it's not I actually use flashlights too which is you know the ones that turn and sometimes if they turn too easy. You know, I'm automatically making sure I didn't loosen it too much. But there's times where I've had the flashlight, you know, yes or no questions, and the EMF's not going off at all. And that's a yeah. lot of investigations. So that's interesting. Definitely. Yeah, that's, we, it's nice to know that someone else has had the same thing with EMF. Yeah. <laughs> we just kind of gave up after a while. Like, we'll break it out once in a while, but we go to a location here, just even just for paranormal investigation. We've got no, like I said, no EMF there, but we have a ton of stuff that goes on in this old house. That's why we call it, you know, a pseudoscience on the show because, like, you're you're trying to be as scientific as possible, but it's none of this has been tested, really, beyond us paranormal investigators using it. You're kind of just sort of stumbling around in the dark, like sometimes literally and figuratively, to to try to figure out stuff, and you know, and you know, people can come up with whatever way to discredit what we found, but you know, we kind of know what we can get, and have to trust it as best we can. Well, I think we live in a time where science has become the new witch doctor, and it's not popular to say that, but we're expected to trust any kind of scientific proclamation whatsoever. And I think one of the, and this isn't a shot at you, Jason, or at Jen or anybody else in the field, but for myself as somebody who's influenced by the writings of Charles Fort, is to a lesser degree or a greater degree, depending on how you position me. I'm a Fortean, I suppose. Mm-hmm. One of the problems is trying to replicate the scientific method when the scientific method has consistently failed the paranormal and failed investigators into ufology and failed, say, cryptid research. It's almost like when we try to be scientific, we're looking at a phenomenon which almost doesn't seem to be able to be put into a box the way that science likes to box things. And so I think it's cool that you identify it as a pseudoscience because to come out and to say we're scientific would be, for me, more concerning because I'd be like, well, why do you want to replicate a scientific establishment which has consistently failed to find us any answers here anyway? Well, and, and, yeah, and, that, and I agree. I mean, it is, I mean, Peter and I have talked about this and I think it'd be great if science would you know, just dive in and, and try to, to look at it you know, and, and give its method, but it, I think... It can't because it isn't something that can easily be replicated. You, you know, it, it's so out on the the fringe. I don't know if you've read the book, that book, um, Hunt for the Skinwalker. Oh, I'm so, aware of it. I haven't actually read that book. I should have though, but I'm, I'm, I know of the book. I've heard of it. My, my wife got it to me for my birthday, so I read it, and it part of the, it, which was great because they actually, you know, uh, uh, NIDS, was, I think was, I can't remember the actual name of it, but as a group mm-hmm. of scientists went and they spent three years there. And every attempt they made to science, they, they, the, all the all the investigators saw things with their naked eye. They could rep- they could get very little actually documented, and it, it's almost like and you mentioned this earlier, Dean. Like there's an intelligence to what this is, whatever it is that's going on out there, and it almost knows how to kind of mess with you in some way, right, and mm-hmm. misdirect you. And I think so. They, their whole the conclusion at the end of the book is you know we can't look at this. We have to start looking at the non scientific expo- like use science in a sense like in terms of coming with other theories, like, you know, parallel dimensions or whatever, and look at that, look at that more and be willing to accept that theory. You know, it's almost like explaining the unexplainable with an unexplainable, but that still science has actually touched on a bit, which is scary, I think, for, for scientists to do. You know, it's funny when you talk about NIDS, I think that was, that was Bigelow's group, right? The guy who used to own the ranch and he's since sold it to a, another billionaire. And I, 
I often wonder, I don't know the end story there, but I often wonder if it was just because it was something that they could never get to the bottom of and what was the point of keeping a hold of of this property when we're not really getting any conclusions. It's just a, an ever-growing mystery the more we look into it. I think that's probably it. And that's kind of what they alluded to, right? Because three years to own a property, they bought it from the Gormans who had had all this stuff happen. Mm-hmm. And the Gormans even stayed on as ranch hands to help out to sort of to document. And they did, and they saw like, you know, the, the large wolf and they saw the lights and they even saw these orange portals open and things come out of it. But every time they, you know, the cameras were rolling, but the cameras didn't pick any of it up, but they saw it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it's, so, you know, when we go into a dark place with our cameras and we see and hear things and we try to document as best we can, like the, the big thing that we seem to pick up is, you know, and Jen can attest, most of it is EVPs, which is electronic. So again, you're dealing with electromagnetic energy, right? Mm-hmm. Like a recording. Whereas on camera, you can sometimes pick things up, you know, and Peter's picked up some pretty cool stuff, but it's, there's nothing like you, the full blown apparition walking up to you and knocking you to the ground, which science wants, you know? Same with a Bigfoot corpse. You know what I mean? Like they, they exactly. want that. Exactly. And that, that, that chances of that happening are so slim, I think, at least for now. <laughs> well, that's the problem. I think you're right. It's the Bigfoot corpse that's wanted, or it's the piece of the Roswell crash, or the Martians landing on the White House lawn, or the, the undeniable footage of a specter appearing in front of somebody and then disappearing. And the phenomenon, whatever it seems, and when I say the phenomenon... I literally mean the phenomenon. I think that all of the different, all the different phenomena from all of these different aspects of paranormal apparitions, and I mean that meaning ufology or cryptids or or spectres or anything. All of it, I suspect, comes from a root manifestation, a root single phenomenon, and it somehow projects itself as different things. But even laying that belief system aside for a minute. All of these different manifestations, or if we want to say they're different, all of these different phenomena they seem to fulfill a very similar psychic need. And this is me putting my academic hat on, hat on now. They seem very much to me to be like the fairy stories of old. And I don't mean fairy like Tinkerbell or dismissive like Disneyland, silly little you know pixies or anything. I mean, a lot of the tales would have people interacting with creatures from another realm and they would come back from fairyland. Again, I don't want people to think of, of lots of little tinkerbells. I mean, an, <laughs> a, another world. They come back with something like fairy bread in their pocket or treasure that the fairies have given them. And as soon as they, as soon as they reach the sunlit world above or as soon as they come home and look at it, it turns to dust in their hands. All of these different sub-communities that look at different aspects of, again, I'll use the paranormal in the broadest possible sense, UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, everything else. The evidence is always the same. It always There's always seems to be something which is going to be that that smoking gun, but it always somehow evaporates. It, it never mm-hmm. is quite enough. And I think whatever the reality, whether I'm right and it's all this, the same phenomenon with all of these various manifestations, or whether there's all of these different phenomena or whether it's all in people's minds, whatever it is, it definitely fulfills a very similar psychic need for us to think that there's something out there more meaningful than the humdrum day-to-day lives that we live. And yet we never quite get that proof of it, but it's there. Yeah, That's a great way to look at it. I, I kind of approach it in a, in a similar way, Dean, because I think if this is if this existence that we're living in right now is it, that's really disappointing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Like it's really disappointing. And I and I don't, you know, I, I definitely like, you know, I've I've have spiritual beliefs. I'm not like a highly religious person, but I, I don't see how we could go from a single celled organism to a Beethoven's concerto. You know what I mean? Without a help yeah. from somewhere. I agree. Um and so I think and that's why why even we call the show We Wanna Believe, because we there there's gotta be more. But what is it? And I think what you're touching on, you're talking about how it's all related. I kind of am leaning that way myself, almost like what Keel talks about. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. It makes perfect sense because why have, uh, you know, UFOs, and I, that's why I like, you know, in, in, you know, on the trail of UFOs, they talk about that, how back in the, you know, 1800s, they saw UFOs, but they looked like, you know, Zeppelin things out of Julius mm-hmm. Byrne. And now we're seeing, you know, yeah. super sleek spacecraft. It just changes with the times, whatever it is. Yeah. And I think it is all tied somehow in to, to something, what that is yet, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> you know, if it's beings from another dimension, or if it's like our subconscious projecting things onto the world, or or if it's from another planet. 
but it's all definitely somehow interrelated. And you're right, it fulfills a need in us to try to make, I think, sense out of our world and, and have hope that, you know, there is something more to it. Not just like after we die that we're not dead anymore, we go somewhere else, but just something more than this, because this just isn't enough. And it, it doesn't answer any of the questions about why we're actually here. And I was worried I was going to offend you for a moment there, Jason. No. You totally, <laughs> you totally get it. I do, right? I, I just, I don't want to be that, I don't. I can't just jump in with both feet and accept it, maybe, because I was, I was actually a mainstream journalist, you know, reporter, crime reporter for years. So I like, I need the facts first before I'm going to make a complete conclusion. But everything I've seen in my life from being a very young child to now doing this show that's been related to the paranormal, and I've seen a lot, it still pushes me to that hope that there is, it is actually really out there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's one of the problems with belief, as you mentioned, Kiel, Kiel said belief is the enemy. I think so mm. much of it is self-fulfilling. So I'll be honest, I went from being very interested in this stuff when I was little to being particularly you know, skeptical throughout my undergraduate degree to when I was back in the real world, probably because I had a hunger for something more than the the jobs I was working. I, I was reading a lot of UFO material and other material. And I would say I became a, a proper believer, you know, that, and when, when you start to look at it through a lens of believerdom, for lack of a better term, I think I just coined a the phrase then believerdom, it does tend to make sense within that belief system. So I think that's why it's important to step back as you just did. And as I also hope that I do, and to say that some of this stuff when you really put it under the, was it a crime reporter? It was your background, yes. whether, whether it's yep. as a crime reporter or whether it's any type of journalist or any type of scientist or any type of investigator, to step back and to start to, to look at it as it is. And particularly when you throw that net broader, it's very dangerous. If, or I think what happens too, or used to happen more, is if people just looked at it as ghosts or people just looked at it as UFOs or people just looked at it as Bigfoot and that's all they were interested in, then it's very easy to fall into that belief system within that kind of sub-community. But when you step back and you start looking at the various different manifestations of whatever this thing might be or, the, or, or different phenomena, if we want to look at it like that, whatever, when you step back and look at it and you start to see the similarities and you start to see where these things intersect and sometimes how these things are part of the same story. Like somebody might have poltergeist activity in their house after seeing a UFO, for example, or somebody mm -hmm. might, somebody might see a Bigfoot and that same night see a UFO, for example. So when you step back and you don't just look at it in this microcosm and you look at it at a more macro level, I think all of a sudden it's very difficult not to go towards that keel perspective, to be honest. I agree, and we we even do that in the in in the we're doing a paranormal investigation side, even within the same case. Like I've been on paranormal investigations where I've seen a toy fly off a shelf, and I saw it, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. And I've got an EVP of something talking to me, but then I'll be standing by this window, and I hear almost like and it it happened to Peter and I. We we heard this moan, which it sounded like you know a little girl moaning in the room, same room like you know about ten minutes earlier. We saw the toy come off the shelf. We heard it and we listened to it and he recorded it and he's like, wow, that was like right next to me. We started hearing it again and again. So we started looking at the room and what that was, it was a crack in the window and it was wind outside causing that moan. So we know we huh. saw the toy and we got the EVP, but this other phenomena was, it was natural, right? Like, and, and there's a real risk when you're a paranormal investigator that as soon as you have that first experience that you, you got something, you then think everything, you got something. And each thing you approach, you have to approach it with that same little bit of skepticism to make sure you're not being completely duped and it's not a natural phenomenon that can explain it. Yes. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of take each, and that's maybe the journalist in me, taking each little piece that you come across and dissecting it. And once you've kind of ruled everything else out, okay, that that is paranormal, for lack of a better word, and that's evidence of it. Um, but you just can't take everything at face value that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of the approach. But, you know, I, I think you got to have that little bit of healthy skepticism to go along with the wanting to believe um, just so you don't get duped <laughs> you know, yeah. by stuff. It's very easy to get duped. Well, I think that's the, I was going to say danger, but maybe it's the lack of integrity of a lot of paranormal shows other than your own is that they hope to have that wind whistle outside so they can say it was a woman screaming or they hope to have that tin can just happen to, you know, be bumped off a shelf so they can say, you know, a ghost bumped it. It's almost like they're looking to label everything paranormal so they can jack the, you know, jack the 
the scary value of the show up, so to speak. I think so. And that's what they're focused on. And that, that's kind of what we've tried really hard not to do. And we're not going to. I, I refuse to. <laughs> Just, it's, there's no way. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. And I think, but I think doing, approaching things that way doesn't take away from the fact like that you're talking about that you've also got to think that all this stuff, it's not all, you know, in a vacuum, it's all related. And for some reason, ghost hunters don't like Bigfoot hunters and UFO hunters don't, you know what I mean? For some reason, Mm -hmm. we've really become these little fringe groups that when really we should all be looking Mm -hmm. together and even other ghost hunting groups, at least up here in Canada, man, they don't work together at all. They hate each other. They're trying to one up each other, looking for things. (laughs) It's like, we're all on the same team here, guys. Like, Mm -hmm. come on. Well, again, talking about Keel, he talked about that in the UFO community 40 years ago. And it's so true how weirdly almost like possessive people become of the story or the case that they have. And it is very strange. It's like people become so obsessed perhaps with being the person to prove it all that they don't want to actually move towards any kind of deeper understanding. Yeah, I, I agree. That definitely seems it. Or, or I know at least up here with the, the groups is that they get this great location that this stuff's happening and they don't want to share it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. And do you find that too, Jen? Like, that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like that here too. <laughs> Which is crazy. I mean, I, I don't know. We're not going to traipse on someone else's haunted spot and ruin it. We can't take the ghosts away. If they're there, they're there. Right? Like, <laughs> right? like We don't have that neat little box in the proton packs. We, you know, uh-huh. <laughs> That'd be cool, but we don't. <laughs> That would be freaking cool. Jen probably has some questions for you as well. Like I said, we didn't map out this episode at all. And I'll keep talking about Keelian type weirdness when I have a sympathetic ear until the sun comes up. So I better let Jen ask some questions. Well, my normal question usually is what piqued your interest in the paranormal? Uh, for me, it started at a, at a young age. Um, there was two things that really stood out when I was quite young. I, uh, I I was in my mom's car and we were picking up a friend of mine for a sleepover. And my mom was at the door. I was wait. I went up and talked to my friend. I went and waited in the car and my, my mom was up there talking to the, the other mom and my buddy was also inside getting his stuff. And I remember sitting in the back and at the back of the car is a hatchback. Suddenly this head popped up at the back of the car that uh-huh. didn't look like my friend, didn't look like anybody I knew and it didn't look human. Gosh. Um, and it terrified me that I hit the floor of that and I was too scared to come up. Yeah. And then my buddy came up and knocked, knocked on the door to come in. And I said, were you just outside the car? Like, you know, a minute or two ago, he's like, no, no, I was inside the house. I just came out. And, you know, my, I was looking my friend in the face. It didn't look at all like what I had seen. Mm-hmm. And there's no one else on the block. And that was kind of the first thing that really like, it stuck with me. I can still vision it today. Yeah. Um, and it scared the crap out of me. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that was sort of the kickoff of things. And then, you know, growing up, I, I just was got this, un, you know, like a lot of kids had this unhealthy fear of the dark and what was under the bed, but it never, it kept persisting mm-hmm. even in the teenagehood, but not always. It was never consistent. Just sometimes I get this vibe that something else is there. Yeah. Um, and then many years later and sort of my, like, you know, like 13, a friend of mine and I rode at, at local lake. We were, we family had a cabin there and we were out at dusk. Looking around, we came across this tree on this normal path that we would take. And for whatever reason, underneath this tree, there is this like this little lean-to, uh, a, a fire pit, small, like almost like, you know, for a doll or a bit bigger and a bone in the lean-to huh. um, that was just peculiar. It was too small for people to use it, but it was bigger than a toy, almost doll size. But we've got, felt really uncomfortable and we ran back to the cabin. And the next morning we woke up, first thing we said, we got to go check that out. Because that just seemed really weird. We went back to that exact same spot and it was all gone. Huh. Wow. And those were kind of the two things that really s- sort of started my whole interest in it. And then from there, it was just a matter of wanting to know why. Like, why did these things happen to me? Why do I have this feeling? What's going on? And it's just kind of grown. And, and you know, like you, Dean, I was a heavy believer for a long time. And then I kind of fell out of it. You get busy with work and careers and stuff like that. But it, it, the, the interest has always resurfaced and never really gone away. And it's interesting because... I went to film school and I always had this interest in the paranormal. And now somehow these two things have collided, even using the journalism a bit. <laughs> that's the dream. Yeah, it is. It's become the dream. But that, that's, that's really how all this began was those two experiences. Like, well, I was probably about six or seven with the first one in the car. And then I was about 13, 14, maybe with the one out in the woods. The one with the car, did it look like your friend or just? No, that's the no, thing that got me. Okay. Not at all. Like it was one of those, you know, you, you know, when you're startled when someone comes up and does like a boo and you kind of go, oh, yeah. and you kind of, yeah. but this was scared me enough that I dove to the bottom. It was a gremlin. I don't know if you knew what a gremlin. Oh the my grem- goodness. 
Yeah. So I was in the back of the, <laughs> the hatchback and I hit the floor. Like I, and I just did not want to look. I did not want to turn around and look. Like, you know, it's not, I wasn't being scared by a friend. Cause that's, you know, I've asked myself that question over and over again. It's like, no man, yeah. I was way too terrified to, I didn't want to see it. I did not want to see it ever again. Yeah. Whatever that was. Scary. Gosh. Is there um, a certain location that you feel like lured or, uh, or more attached to? Like you constantly feel like you need to go back there? There's a place here in town. It's called Tronchial Sanitarium. And it was a tuberculosis clinic uh, for many years. Then it became an, an insane asylum. And it closed down in the early 80s when there was a big movement here in Canada to deinstitutionalize people. Yeah. And it, of course, it's an insane asylum. <laughs> it became the place that everyone wanted to break into and experience. But I had the pleasure of a, a very good friend of mine became the caretaker there. So he started letting me in to take a look around. And I even would, that's where I started doing my own investigations out there. Um, and when I was in journalism school, we had to write a paper, or an article that we wanted to submit. So I, I love the Fortean Times. So I'm like, well, I want to go out to Tronquil and I want to investigate there. And I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get a skeptic and I'm going to get a guy I know who's got a video camera. <laughs> Someone who's a psychic. And we went out and did the whole overnight investigation. And we had some stuff, cool stuff happen. And I've always, I kept going back for years. And now you can't, it's not safe anymore. But I would love to go back in there again, even to do what we want to believe. Because it's so, there's so, it's even got the tunnels underground. Because here it, used, yeah. it's, it can snow a lot and the snow can last for months. So the easiest way to move patients and food was through the tunnels mm -hmm. to the different buildings. And it's, it's just a great spot. And it's, it's creepy mm -hmm. and it has a lot of stories attached to it. And, and like I said, I've been there and had stuff happen that I just can't quite explain. So yeah. it, it's, it's probably like my favorite spot. And it always lures, I, keeps, I have that pull always to go back out. But you just can't get in there right now with the current owners and just the state of a lot of the buildings. You said that that's a place that you would like to go back to do a we want to believe in, but is there any teasers you can give us for a location you know you're going back to after the barn episodes? So we, we've shot, we shot another investigation after the barn uh, that'll kind of broadcast, will hit Joe Blow November, December, and it's called The Doll's House. And it's actually the spot I was telling you about where Peter and I saw the toy come off the shelf huh? Uh, and the, the, with the window. But we went out, um, it was about back in June, and we did a, a case there, uh, myself, Peter, and then Marcus, who's one of the other camera people. We only had like a skeleton crew for that one. But we got that, we used the laser grid, and we got some cool stuff with the laser grid. And it's called the doll's house, because upstairs, there's a room someone died in, and it was a kid's room, and it's full of those turn-of-the-century dolls, porcelain dolls. Oh, oh creepy. Yeah. It is just on its own right. <laughs> and it... And we had some, and there's some interesting stories that went on there. And we had quite a, that day that we were there, this house has always been good for us in terms of just is a paranormal investigator. So we wanted to film there and it, we, it, it did not disappoint um, at all. And then we're in the middle, all, uh, next Friday, Saturday, we're doing our last shoot. We're doing we're, uh, a series of Bigfoot episodes. So we've done two Bigfoot hunts that we're going to combine. And then we're going out to do one last one. There's like an overnight which we're filming on December 9th, uh, uh, sorry, September 19th. And those will come out sort of late in the year, early next. Uh, but we're going to bring, like Shannon's agreed to come on and we're going to do like a video interview with her. Oh, great. And then Ken Gerhardt as well. And, and intercut those video interviews with our three different Squatch hunts, yeah. um, which Fantastic. is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. We're pretty, this, this became very ambitious. Like it, we were going outside of the realm of what we're comfortable with. But it's proven really good um, so far. The first hunt we went out with an, an Aboriginal storyteller, an artist, and he had, who's had Bigfoot encounters. We went to the spots where he's had those, and he's relayed them, and we saw some interesting stuff. The second hunt, we went up to this remote lake where a guy's been fishing every year for twenty years, and every time that he's out on the lake and he gets near this one corner of the lake, he gets he gets these three knocks, and the knocks persist mm -hmm. until he leaves. Huh. So we went up there, and this last one we've just found a good location. We're just going to go out like almost like a Blair Witch camp. <laughs> And just sort of see what happens. Oh, wow. You know, try some wood knocks and some squatch, you know, some calls. And uh, I hear if you play a tape of a baby crying, it will it could bring something out. So right when we're ready to leave, we're going to play that tape and see what happens. <laughs> That's not creepy at all, Jason. <laughs> no, it won't be at all. <laughs> so <laughs> we're kind of pushing. And then then we've got another sort of typical uh, couple potential hauntings we want. we got a potential poltergeist case we want to get into to film after the Bigfoot episodes. And we're lining up a UFO excursion as well so we're, we want to keep it fresh good no yeah. you guys have so much on the on the docket yeah we're trying we're hoping we don't get a second wave here that forces us all to go back inside 
So we wanted to get as much done kind of over the summer as we could, just in case, because we release one a month. So this, even with the Bigfoot ones, that'll get us to kind of, you know, February, March. And then if we can get in to do the, uh, a different, the Poltergeist one or something, that'll get us sort of April, May. You know what I mean? So we, we, mm-hmm. we try to do about two to three episodes per investigation. So we want to have enough in the can just in case. Before we let you go, could you maybe tell us what your creepiest experience you've ever had, other than the Gremlin one when you were a kid? What's the creepiest <laughs> experience you've had since you're a paranormal investigator? The creepiest one was actually out at Tronquil. And I went out there with a friend of mine, Donna, who, who's, who's a, a psychic medium, and who at least she claims to be, and I've seen, had pretty good luck with some of her stuff. So we went out and we were down, we had been down in the tunnels and we kind of came up in the laundry building and we're like, we didn't want to, we wanted to go, it was time to go, but we didn't want to go walk back across the property. It would, you know, take longer. We figured we'd go back down into the tunnels to see what would happen. So we went right back to the door we had just come through. I opened it. I got it open about halfway and suddenly something pulled with such force that I was pulled off my feet and slammed into the door. Gosh. Donna screamed and ran. <laughs> and, yeah. I, and then I followed her because it was, I oh, just no. n- had never had anything like that happen before or since. But it was enough force. It wasn't like it was locked. We'd just been through it. It wasn't like there was enough of a draft. We didn't have any trouble. It pulled with so much force, like something on the other side, just like no, and just heaving back. And I was off balance and hit the door and ran out. And that, I was shaken for days after that. Like I actually stopped investigating for a while after that, quite a while. I don't blame you. Yeah, it was, it was terif- terrifying. And like I said, never before and never since I've had anything that dramatic happen that I felt threatened and actually was physically moved, you know? Yeah, yeah. Because that's so rare. So yeah. Well, I had so much fun chatting to you, Jason, and I'm sure Jen did as well, even though I hogged yes. the conversation a little bit when we, got, <laughs> yeah. when we got into the killing things. But we need to have you back on and, and track throughout the show. So after We Want to Believe has punched out some more episodes, let's get you back on because it was so much, so much fun and just a complete pleasure chatting to you today. Well, thank you so much. I'd love to do that. I had a great time uh, chatting with you guys as well. It's been it's been a blast. Uh, thank you so much for for having me on and for your interest in the show and and supporting it. Yeah, I'd love to come back anytime, and we could talk about pretty much anything you want. <laughs> so. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation with Jason Hewlett as much as I enjoyed having it. Check out Jason's paranormal web series, We Want to Believe, on the Joe Blow Horror Videos YouTube channel. And you can listen to his always entertaining radio program and podcast, From the Basement, at wecamefromthebasement.com. Of course, you can find us at talkingweird.com, or you can visit our new Fortian hub site, charlesfort.org. There you'll find not only the full Talking Weird episode archive, but also loads of other Fortean goodness, including a t-shirt store with over 25 incredible and original UFO, cryptid, and paranormal-themed t-shirt designs, available in both women's and men's sizes. And now the store also includes Fortean-themed face masks. If you haven't already, please like Talking Weird on Facebook and Instagram at Talking Weird Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to the podcast. We're available on most podcast platforms and YouTube. And if you enjoyed this episode of Talking Weird, please leave us a review. Jen and I would really appreciate it. Make sure to join us again next time as we explore more mysterious byways of this haunted planet. And until then, have a happy Halloween and keep it weird. Weird.